going out on both Twitch and YouTube. Let me see. Technology. Yes. It's working. And can people and can people see it? Hello, null denominator on Twitch. Hello. We have two sure likes. But I don't see anyone in the chat watching it yet, but I'm sure it'll just take a second to catch up. Okay. Um, yeah, there we go. Kyle Stern is here. All right, so let's let's have this conversation again because I think it's vital. <laughs> like, this is early day. You know, I feel like I've already won the battle on Milk Dramata. Yes. Right? No one, I don't hear anybody saying Milk Media. No, that would be terrible. Or and, and Dramata Way. No. No, milk drama is the is the correct way to describe it. So I feel like that has gone. You know, that's so now we need to decide. We, the council, have to decide on on Hycean worlds, and because like there's now going to be a bigger. Hycean, I wish we could like repurpose the word Halcyon. How about High Ocean? How about High Ocean? That would work. I'm good with yeah, that. so it's like H Y and then ocean. Yeah, and then that way you don't get the full D, the hydro, the D R, the hydrocean, yeah, yeah. high ocean. Hmm. I might. It might be too late. <laughs> so really, I think we're stuck with deciding whether it's Hycian or Hycian. Hycian. Yeah. But that's like not pronouncing ocean correctly. But now it's a new word, and that is how you would pronounce it in English if you read that word. Although, obviously, you know, English is gibberish. Terrible. So, yeah, um, it does follow no rules. <laughs> so to say, like, these rules is to, like, forget that English breaks all the rules. English takes other languages down, down dark alleys and steals from them. Yeah. Apparently, I have a hot mic. But then people are saying, yeah, people are saying that. So my guess is that, that. that it's from I last week. So, last week, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so my guess is that I just have to make sure that my screens <laughs> don't flash. Like if I, if I don't let my screensaver go on, then this won't be a problem. Okay, you are no longer blasting the planet. Sorry about that, everyone. I have, I have no control over this. It's I am, me. I I'm can it. do this whole episode with my with my hands in front of my eyes. No problem. <laughs> my, this is, a, this is a hands off experience at this point. You are, Pamela is engineer and the educator. So, yeah. So, okay, so there we go. I, I just want to let everyone know the reason we're doing this on a Wednesday is twofold. One fold is on Monday, the technology was like, no, you are not allowed. We will not let you. Mm -hmm. And Fraser kept freezing and turning into pixelation. And it was just going to be too think. hard for our poor humans to try and edit it because we like yeah, them. We decided to start over. The other reason is my gallbladder is coming out on Monday because it decided to start gifting me with sharp edged stones. And when I move wrong, I can feel it stabbing me. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend this sensation. And uh, so we're recording next Monday's episode and we're recording last Monday's episode. And Together. Yes. Um, according to my doctor, I should be back at work within 48 hours. And then I read like recovery information from other countries that have universal health care. And they're like, after a week to 10 days, you may consider mm -hmm. going back to work. Full recovery takes four to six weeks. And I'm like, what the fuck is up with 48 hours? Why are you saying 48 hours? And I know why they're saying 48 hours. It's because you're American. You got to work. Go back to work. No one's got time for this. Yeah, I am not pleased. I am. I yeah. am very glad that I took the time to read the NHS information because it was much more extensive. Yep. <sighs> I'm just going to okay. grumble. Mm. Well, I mean, you're pre-grumbling. Wait till the post-grumbling happens. Why? We will what? give you nothing but support, compassion, and empathy for this difficult. 
thing that you're going through. This sucks. Yeah, it I mean, really, really does. Like, really, like, like rule one of being made out of meat is hang on to all of your organs as mm -hmm. best you can. Yeah. 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 And so like to get to a situation where one of your organs has betrayed you so much that it's been, that it's been forced out of your body to go live on its own is, mm -hmm. is, uh, is tough. So. Yes. Yes. And, and yeah, it's yeah. just rude when you move wrong and you can feel the inside of your body stabbing you. No. <laughs> Yeah, As yeah. I said, so, it's rude. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually went and saw the doctor yesterday because we had talked at, afterwards sort of talking about this and, you know, welcome to too much information land. Yes, um, yes. But I, I've sort of been doing a lot of like carrying trees and <laughs> like not the smartest stuff. And I've got this sort of jabbing pain down sort of just a little around my waistline. And the doctor said, ooh, that sounds like a hernia, a possible yeah. hernia. Yeah. So, but it's gone away. And okay. she said, so just don't be stupid. Like you can, you can live your whole life and this won't get any worse, but don't be a dummy. No more so carrying trees solo. Right. Just or live with my legs. Right. If yeah. I'm going to carry a tree, yeah. live with my legs. Right. Like just be careful about this. And, and so like, I may like work out some kind of like wheeled gadget so I can sort of grab one into the tree and then wheel it through the forest from the other side. Because they 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 roll out of out of wheelbarrows like they're it's it's nasty oh, yeah. to use them in wheelbarrows right but but I'm sort of imagining some kind of like little wheels at the end of my of the tree and then I only have to carry half the tree and I'll let the ground carry the other half but anyway the point is um yeah you know just never forget that you're made of meat just, so at just... at stables that I've worked at they've had these little not actually golf carts that were electric and usually John Deere green or caterpillar yellow that you could attach a small hay trail or two that would be perfect for moving trees around. Well, I mean, my, the paths that I do this are, are two feet wide, right? They're tiny oh. little paths through the forest. Okay. So I need, you know, they'll work with a wheelbarrow, but I haven't widened them up to the point that I could yeah. drive up like a four wheeler, you know, even like a little like quad you in need, there. You need an, an all terrain, uh, <laughs> like, I, I, I like, like scooter. No, no, I like I like the physicalness of it, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's just a matter of cutting them into smaller pieces and and just being more careful about it. Like I was definitely pulling hundred pound trees, you know, that I was lifting out of the out of the out of the forest and then stacking them up, to, you know, and I would do a whole yeah. bunch of them, which you know, great for my body, but <laughs> except for you know the potential for me getting a hernia. So anyway, I'm not gonna get stupid. That's all. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fraser pay someone. You know, the point is, is like <laughs> to do this myself. The point is yeah. to, is to be there to observe the forest, to, to plant stuff, to think about it and to get physical because mm -hmm. I spend all day sitting in front of a computer, yeah. you know, uh, reporting on space news and I want to get out into the forest and cut down trees. <laughs> and well, and, and the other side of that is like, I, my yard gets lots and lots of volunteers growing in it, yeah. and I periodically have to remove the things that shouldn't be there. But occasionally the volunteers will turn out to be things like blackberries. Yes. And, and if I'm the one doing it, I can have a spontaneous, wait, nope, this thing gets to live. And if you pay someone, they're not going to care. They're just going to raise everything to the ground and bark mulch it. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, for me, the destination the, is the journey. Yeah, that's all. Like, I like I want to spend hours every day out in the forest, um, just observing nature, noticing cool stuff, planting trees, growing things, harvesting berries. Uh, it's a lot of fun. What's the weirdest can't kill you thing you've seen so far? Can't kill you? What do you mean? So, like, you've seen bears and mm -hmm, bears. Mm -hmm. Bears Cougars. fall in. Yeah, yeah. So like in my yard, the weirdest cool thing I've seen is this little tiny spider that basically had a castle on its butt. I don't know hmm. what kind of orb weaver it was, but it had like this really cool set of cones on its butt. 
it was weird. Like it almost looked like sort of sharp, jaggy. Yeah. Like spikes on it. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, that's a class of, of spider. Mm, we look for them in Costa Rica. Carlos obsessed by these. I forget what they're called. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. They're really cool. And they're, and they're sort of rare north of tropical areas. We don't have any in Canada, but, but the fact that you saw one is, is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I mean, ermine like we have mink and various cool. kinds of yeah yeah i mean they they Land kill daughter. people chickens, but yeah um yeah and then obviously deer and yeah. other pests yeah <laughs> which i chased a bunch of deer out of the garden last night i have a, I have a, I have a bunch of cameras set up and then i get a notification on my phone deer and so then i very quietly move to the front door and then i turn on the lights and i run out screaming at the deer and it just you know, freaks them out and, and they jump and run and jump and you hear them crashing into the forest and they say, you know, they're like a couple of hundred feet away before they finally stop and tell me why we're safe. So that yeah, I hope city is the deer way don't care. Yeah. That's how I hope we'll get to the point where the deer are, you know, are at least wary of this place. This is the scary place. So, um, all right. Until my, until my, my fence properly grows in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, let us begin. If you're, uh, we've got okay. two episodes to get through. Now, are we going to do one episode and and then stop the stream and then do the next episode, or are we just going to drive right through? Uh, we should stop uh, stop the audio, but I think the video is probably fine. Okay, that sounds good to me. Okay. All right. Well, then you know whoever's doing the post production can can put rebuild this live stream in a way yeah, that makes yeah. sense to the public. Okay. Yes, we're sorry, Beth. We apologize in advance. Um, and now for people who are here on Monday, you'll watch us recreate an episode <laughs> and if, there will be a variation of astronomy cast that will never exist except in, in a piece of YouTube. All right. It's true. Yeah. Now I'm going to wait for you to make all of your devices record properly. I've done that. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> I can just press the record button. Yes. Okay, fine. Astronomy Cast, episode 691, Jupiter's Changing Red Spot. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Sciences. <laughs> <sighs> I'm going to record this bit again, and then I'm sure Richard can, can do it. Yeah. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? A little sad. I we, know. Uh, we had to say goodbye to our dog this week. So That's just hard on the heart. Yeah, it is. You know, you sort of spend all this time, have all this love, but then you sort of know... It's time. Yeah. So the best things anyway, in light are f life are fleeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you know it's it's uh. So for those of you who do have your fur babies, give them a hug and a kiss from us. Jupiter's great red spot is one of its most iconic features, first seen hundreds of years ago. Although it's certainly long lasting, it's been changing in size over the last few decades, shrinking, changing in color. Is it fading away? And what can the changes tell us about storms on giant planets? And we'll talk about this some more, but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right. So those of you listening to this might not know, but this is the second time that we tried to record this episode. <laughs> and so I'm going to remember what I asked you last time, which was when was the first time that you saw Jupiter's great red spot. So, so for me, I think it was probably at some random point when I was in elementary school. My parents got me the exact type of telescope we tell people never to get. Do not get one of these. I had like a Sears Thanksgiving Day sale four inch Newtonian telescope that I did my best to look at absolutely everything with. And I have no memory of seeing Jupiter, but I know I must have 
because I pretty much looked at everything out there to be seen except for Andromeda because I could never find Andromeda as a kid. That that would have to wait till I moved somewhere other than Boston. You're waiting for me to tell you how yes. easy it was for me to find Andromeda. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. What we talked about last time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny how how this works. Yeah, so you know, I live in dark skies and grew up in like whatever the cold, the darkest boreal skies you could get. Yeah. And you know, it's not quite as good now, but it was definitely very very dark skies. And so you could just see Andromeda with the unaided eye. And so you would sort of unfocus your eyes, look in the sky, and you would see this blurry blob. And you're like, oh, there's Andromeda. And then you would point your telescope at that thing. And for you, you had to star hop your way there. And, and the problem was that I could, like, see Cassiopeia. I could see the square of, of Pegasus, but not really the legs. And the square was kind of iffy. And there's just this vast swath of nothing between the square and the W. And that was not quite enough to star hop. <sighs> so, yeah. So for me, I bought my first telescope when I was 14. And... Uh -huh. And I sort of did it right. I got a, a proper four and a half inch Newtonian reflector, paid a couple hundred dollars of my, you know, hard saved money. <laughs> and um, it didn't have an equatorial mount. It had an Altaz mount, but it was still a pretty good telescope. And I had yeah. a bunch of eyepieces with it. And so I was able to see Jupiter right away and the rings of Saturn and the bands across the planet on Jupiter and the moons of Saturn or the moon of Jupiter and, and, you know, look at the moon and so on. And then I bought a Barlow lens and the Barlow lens gives you a three times magnification, which you think is going to be great, but it's actually not that useful for seeing deep sky objects because it doesn't improve the light gathering of your telescope. Right. So it just sort of magnifies the image, but then makes it fainter. And yeah. so often things look best when they're actually with a very fast eyepiece. But Jupiter, because it's so bright, you know, all the planetary stuff look great in uh what you see and so so you could see i could see the the great red spot on on the surface of jupiter and uh and sort of watch it and sort of come back and be like oh red spot oh no red spot you know yeah. while jupiter's in the sky because it rotates so quickly and so you sort of you know you've got about a i would say like a 30 percent chance of seeing it because you know you're sort of it's hard to know when it's sort of at, yeah. at extreme angles on the sides of the planet but when it's face on yeah you can definitely see it and then you know i could share that with my friends and family. So uh, it's great to sort of see these things that you had sort of seen pictures of and you had, a, had context. Yeah. And, and while I'd seen Jupiter plenty, the first time I actually remember seeing the Great Red Spot was the summer of Shoemaker Levy 9 when I was an intern out at Kitt Peak and all the amateurs were there with their amazing systems and their eyepieces and their Barlows. And so it was someone like you, except much older and gray haired, because it seemed like all of them were older and gray haired. Um, that was like, hey, do you want to see the dark spots from the impact? And then, of course, I could see the red spot as well. It was kind of awesome. Spots upon spots next to spots. So then, you know, that's us. When yeah. did humanity first notice Jupiter's great red spot? This, this is of debate. And... One of the things that I find amusing is like most NASA websites are, will be like, we have been looking at Jupiter's great red spot for 400 years because the telescope's 400 years old. And there is questionable evidence whether or not Galileo was able to see the red spot. He was a good enough scientist that he wasn't going to claim to see things he couldn't repeatedly see clearly. Right. Yeah. So while looking at some of his sketches, folks are like, maybe, maybe not. When folks look at Jupiter with similar telescopes to what he was using, it's really just a cute little fuzzy blob. And his primary goal was to watch the moons orbiting Jupiter. And so that's really what he was recording. So we can't really know for sure. Did he, didn't he? But uh, Robert Hooke, clearly saw and documented it in 1664. Giovanni Cassini clearly saw it and documented it in 1665. Or at least they saw and documented a red spot. Continuous observations of the red spot didn't really start until about 1711 when it started appearing in artwork. 
and being continuously observed on a yearly to multiple times per year basis. We're going to talk about this some more, but it is time for another break. And we're back. Now, do we have any sense about how long the red spot has lasted? Like if people try to calculate how long this thing has been around based on how it changes in size? So the problem is we didn't really have great measurements of it prior to the age of photography. People did sketches. The sketches were pretty accurate, we think. But in the grand scheme of things, this this is something that has varied in, in human lifetimes with highest quality measurements from a little over three Earth diameters to a little over one Earth diameter. And while a 60% uh, difference in size is dramatic when you're hand sketching things, Yes. It's, it's, it's hard to say with certainty. Yes, it varied by 20% according to this pencil drawing done by someone using the U.S. atmosphere or rather using the Earth's atmosphere. I don't know right, why I said right. U.S. Yeah, using their eyes yeah. to sketch a thing in the, yeah. and you know that Jupiter is getting closer and farther. Right. Right. And so scale is, is really hard to. And everything's fuzzy until you get above the atmosphere. And the first really clear images that told us this is a spinning anticyclonic storm, we didn't get until 1979 when we sent voyagers. Right. It took took spacecraft to go there. I mean, it is kind of amazing how many of the things that we take for granted today, uh-huh. uh, as you said, the Great Red Spot, yeah. the um, the the atmosphere of Venus, the landscape of Mars, these things were all you know the big volcanoes on Mars. Like these are things that we only found out about when we sent a spacecraft to these destinations. You yeah. know, with all of the 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 Soviet Venera spacecraft that had to make their way down through the atmosphere and failed. And only then did you find out how bad that atmosphere was. Um, and and yeah, and so you think about it, like, like it's only like we were both children yeah. when the Voyagers arrived. When Betty launched. White, yeah. Betty White predated sliced bread and knowledge that Venus and Mars didn't have life on them. Right. Um, so, so then, so like, what is our modern understanding of what the Great Red Spot is? We know that it is a counter-rotating storm. These are maintained by high-pressure fronts. We get the same thing usually in the winter here in North America when a high-pressure uh, front drops down from the north and things start turning in the direction opposite of what we expect from watching hurricanes, for instance. We also know that it varies in color slightly over time. It has gone from browner to redder. And we know that its shape has gone from more cigar-shaped to more circular, while at the same time, we're pretty sure its its thickness has, has gone so that it now reaches up to higher altitudes than it did in the past. And this is one of those like things that people don't understand. Like even when you saw old renderings of the yeah. Great Red Spot from Cosmos and things like that, you kind of imagine this um, this swirling whirlpool that if you could sort of fly above it, you would sort of see the the walls of the cloud tops descending down below. But it's the opposite of that. It's yeah. actually raised up. It's a yeah. it's a bump on the surface of Jupiter. Now, there are other storms on Jupiter. Oh, yeah. And they're like smaller. They're generally white. So what do we think is the cause of Jupiter's color compared to the other objects on the surface? There, There's a variety of different ideas that all come down to large molecules, haze, that uh, just is really good at reflecting redder shades of light. Now, the question becomes... Is the storm haze all the way down, or is this an effect of the chemicals getting lofted up, interacting with the ultraviolet light from the sun, and essentially the storm's 
I saw one article that explained it as being sunburned, where the the storms um, essentially are interacting with ultraviolet light and they're red at the top, but if we could go further down, they'd be clear. And this, I not clear, but white. And this idea is carried forward by the reality that in 2000, we saw three different white ovals, white storms, merge together over time and become a new, we call it Red Spot Junior because we're not very creative, but Red Spot Junior really only came into existence about the year 2000 and Red Spot Junior is hanging out about the same color. It's also an anticyclonic storm and it is almost the size of Earth. So you have two storms, one shrinking, the other growing that are the same color. And so we have to ask the question, is this other storm what caused the Great Red Spot to form? And the fact that we know that it formed is part of the reason that we're always cautious to say, we think that what Hook and Cassini saw in the 1600s was the same red spot, but we can't say it definitively. Hmm. So they're, they're like the great red spot that we know today could yeah. have could have been a more like we know definitely from the 1800s. There's been yes. like continuous observations of this. And we know it's been yeah. around for over 100 years, but we don't yes. know if it, it's the same thing that was there 400 years ish ago. And really since 1731, we've had pretty good observations going that show it's been the same latitude, which is easy to see because other spots pick other bands. And this is actually a key point. One of the things they think that keeps the storm going is it's wedged between the these uh, convective bands and it's the energy from those bands they think that keeps it spinning. And I mean, this is something that's always so fascinating to me. When you look at the bands across the surface of Jupiter, they are moving in alternating directions. Yeah. And so the one, you know, you see one band and the, and, and the, all those clouds are, are like, like a jet stream that's going yeah. in one direction. And then the next band down, everything's going in the opposite direction. The next band down is going in the opposite, you know, it's going back and forth all the way down. And so you get as these, you know, you have the two bands and then the band in between going the other direction yeah. and that sets up these whirling forces and we have something very similar on earth it's just that we have land that yes. breaks up these yes these counter rotating uh bands and so we don't get the same kind of structure that is beautifully described you know around a sphere in the way that it is at jupiter so back to that idea that you mentioned earlier about so you're saying that you know one possibility is that we are that that the great red spot because it's so large is yeah. dredging up material deeper down into the planet. Yes. And so we're seeing that material exposed to the surface. And then the other possibility is because that storm is so big, it is holding material aloft higher and longer than other material and so Allowing it's getting hazes. a chance yeah to turn that red color. Yes. And and that latter idea uh, makes our new ability to observe with more and more missions all that more important because if we can see that cloud altitude is related to color, that will help us start to understand this. But right now we just don't have the missions capable of this specific kind of understanding we'd love to get. Right. All right. We're going to talk about this some more, but it is time for another break. And we're back. So I think, you know, the whole point of this episode, you know, we talked about the gray red spot in the past, but I think what's really interesting is that it is changing in size. Yes. It is shrinking. Yes. Quickly. Yes. And people are really noticing this. So yes. give us a sense of, of how much the great red spot has shrunk and, and how long has this been going on? Since 1979, when Voyager 2 was there, it has shrunk roughly 60%. And wow. as we got better and better telescopes, we were able to start seeing in the 2000s, essentially red chunks flaking off as the storm got smaller, which has led people to wonder, is the storm dissipating? And then we're also seeing the overall temperature of Jupiter seems to be increasing. And there's lots of reasons for this. Don't go like 
getting confused with earth climate change totally right. different world totally different yeah. situation totally different scenarios but it's thought that as jupiter undergoes this long term transport of thermal energy down to its southern hemisphere those increasing temperatures are affecting the storms in ways that we don't fully understand and here on earth we struggle enough and part of our struggle is admittedly we have land jupiter doesn't have land it doesn't have any of these frictional forces like we have that can pull energy out of the storm from below but at the same time we don't have the same massive thermal conveyance we don't have heat getting generated in our core because we're that well we do but it's a different scale everything at jupiter is a different scale and works just enough differently that we see the thermal changes going on we see the warming going on we see the red spot changing color and getting smaller we don't know if this is transitory, permanent. We don't know if the red spot's going to go away. There is a whole lot we don't know, and that's mm -hmm. actually really awesome. We keep doing science, we keep launching spacecraft, and we keep struggling because we don't know everything and we want to. So, I mean, I, there must be multiple camps then, right? Oh, One yeah. camp says it is disappearing. Do they yes. give a sense of if it is disappearing, how long it has left? So, so this is one of those things where I have to admit, I look at a number of papers and all of them contradict each other. And so I'm like, okay, so it may end and we don't actually know when. I, I have not picked sides. I, I have simply decided to be an observer and to step back and watch the argument as a sport. But we've seen smaller storms disappear. Oh, yeah. The ovals. Occasionally we'll lose an oval here and there. Jupiter has... It's, it's named ovals, numbered ovals, that are the white storms that last. Some of them have been there as long as we've had the resolution to see them. One of the three storms that formed uh, Red Spot Jr. We actually watched it pop into existence in 1938, but we already knew about the other two. They'd been around as long as we had the capacity to see them. So the fact that we can occasionally see these bright white storms pop in and out of existence, merge and change tells us this is a dynamic system. Change is possible. And so what typically happens, like when a storm dies, what do we see? Well, we haven't had the resolution in papers I've read. You may jump in and say that you've seen something I haven't. That often happens here. Um, so far, we haven't had the detailed resolution while a storm was going away to see in detail what was happening, except in cases where things merged and we were able to say with certainly those two things merged. Otherwise, it was much more of a, huh, that spot didn't come back around again. Huh, that spot that we saw three months ago isn't there anymore. And this is where it would be glorious if we could somehow stick a spacecraft far away from each of these gas giants, but closer than anything we have now so that we could see the full disk and see the change in weather. And this is something I think a lot of people don't understand. We had the capacity to see so much with Voyager because it started out far enough away to capture the entirety of the disk and then zoomed past. Galileo snuggled right up to the world and wasn't catching those same full disk images. Juno has off and on had the capacity to see full disk, but most of the time it's not seeing the full disk either. And for weather, you need to see the full disk. So we need like some kind of uh, like spacecraft that's orbiting at, you know, Jupiter's right L1 height. or L2. Well, the L1 or the L2, or, you know, like at the equatorial orbit, right? And so you've got this yeah. perfect position where it can just, like, it can turn at the same rate that the that the storm is turning and just like storm watch nonstop. So that, would be, that doesn't, they, like, that doesn't work because Jupiter orbits, I think in like nine ish hours mm -hmm. and 
you'd have to be in a really low orbit to go around every nine hours. So is there not a geostationary orbit for Jupiter that you then modify to the speed that the... So the there, are ge there are geostationary orbits, but the geostationary orbit doesn't give you the full disk view. Oh, so I mean, it depends. yeah. So I'm getting 160,000 kilometers. Yeah. And that's Seems not okay. Gonna, it, it's okay ish, but it's a really big world. You want to yeah. stand back and enjoy it. Yeah. But I want, but all, but if all you want to do is just stare at that one storm. Okay. I feel like yeah. you can do it. Yeah. That's true. If it's only one storm. orbit. Yeah. And then just have it constantly track the storm nonstop and have all the right yeah. instruments on board. This is exciting. Let's do this. Let's, <laughs> let's crowd on this mission. Let's send it to Jupiter. Um, and also do a fisheye lens so that you can catch, albeit distorted the rest of the world. Right. So what, what do you think this tells us? You know, we only have still the one, I guess we have four examples of giant worlds here in the solar yeah. system. Saturn is nothing like Jupiter. No, it does have a great white storm that, right. that seems to be fairly persistent. And Neptune has a storm. Yeah. Um, its which, weather is variable. It has storms but, that come and go. But we required Webb to be able to actually see the storm again because yes. it had been seen by the Voyagers, and then we didn't have the technology to see it, yeah. and now we can That's see it true. again. So, That's true. Um, so we need to go back, <laughs> I think. But what do you think about exoplanets? Do we see any kind of evidence of storms on exoplanets as they're transiting or... So we're getting there. What we can see is variations in light that cannot be explained purely through change in sun planet angle. So, so essentially, as you have a, I don't have, I'm going to use, we're going to pretend this is a planet real fast. So as we have our planet going around, it's going to be getting hit by different differing amounts of sunlight that it reflects back towards us until it's essentially uh only showing its dark side and uh it's mostly illuminated right before it passes behind the star so there should be a nice smooth variation in the amount of light received from these planets but sometimes the variations in light can't be purely explained by the variations in uh, reflected light. And so this starts to tell us that there are either land masses that vary, there are clouds. And as we look at different kinds of worlds with the gas giants, we can be like, okay, there are variable clouds. And yeah. that's cool. And I mean, I know we're already at the point where you can detect changes in temperature between the, yes. the hemispheres of the planet for the ones that yes. are highly locked. And you like their their somewhere facing side is extremely hotter than the than the far side but yeah. it would be amazing to get to this point where we're we are resolving temperature changes due to atmospheric weather land masses oceans yeah it's so exciting. we can see the temperature variations we can see the brightness variations we just don't have the detail to know exactly what's causing everything and it, more telescopes, please. That is the moral of this show. More, <laughs> More telescopes, telescopes, please. please. Yes. Yeah. All right. Now place your bets. Do you think we're going to lose Jupiter's great red spot in our lifetime? No. Okay. Thank you, Pamela. <laughs> thank you, Fraser. And thank you so much to all of the people out there who support this show. As a reminder to all of you, if you would like to get this completely ad free, uh, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash astronomy cast. We do have a staff that we sometimes torture with our uh, with our retakes and multiple takes and everything else. And we pay them um, to do all of the miraculous editor editing work that they do. Um, so this week, I would like to thank our Patreons, Jim Schooler, Kimberly Reich, Alex Cohen, Matthias Hayden, the big squish squash, Tim McMacken, Claudia Mastriani, Scott Cohn, Justin Proctor, K Tim Garish, Kinsaya Pinflienko, uh, Gre Gregory Singleton, Kenneth Ryan, uh, Jeff Wilson Cooper, Don Mundus, Michael Regan, Paul D. Disney, Ivan Zagrev, 
I just totally mangled your name. I'm sorry. Um, Benjamin Mueller, Michelle Cullen, uh, Veronica Cure, Scott Briggs, Matt Rucker, J. Alex Anderson, Frodo uh, Tanbao, uh, Ninja Nick Antisor, MHW 1961 Soup, Bruce Amazine, uh, Jim McGeehan, Father Prax, Peter, Abraham Cottrell, Schmersom, Mark Stephen Raznak, Philip Grand, James Roger, Alex Rain, Gabriel Galfin, Paul L. Hayden, Dwight Ilk, Benjamin Davies, and Glenn McDavid. Thank you all for everything you do. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye-bye. And then they saved before going on to the next episode. <laughs> to do another episode. Yeah. All right. So this is 691. 691. And then we'll start the next one. 692. Yup. Okay. All right. <laughs> we have all sorts of applause over on Twitch, and it brings me joy. How come YouTubers can't applaud? Is that like a... They have you... they have animated emotes, and the emotes are applauding. Mm. Okay. All right. It's it's quite adorable. There there are clapping elephants, clapping cat paws. And these aren't like any custom emotes on our channel. These are just regular Is twitch emotes the yeah hmm. or they're custom from other channels that mm. got carried over to our channel so like miri amber has one of those uh flail balloons that you sometimes see out in front of stores and stuff mm. yep yep um she has one of those as an emote that has been invoked so we are being uh flaily blow up dude it at kind of want to put one of those in my garden that would be awesome that would also freak, help with the deer yeah to freak the deer out yeah yeah that would be cool solar power the sucker yep all right tell me when you're ready all right i am pressing record on my audio i am pressing record on the video we are recording okay astronomy cast episode 692 mission roll call part one Earth orbit. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, a weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of Cosmo Quest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well. We are recording this episode early because on the day we would normally record it, my gallbladder is being removed. Right. And I have to say, I'm not entirely okay about this. Mm. But I am glad to be here, and I am glad for all the patrons out there that allow us to do this show. And I just want to remind everyone that if you join our Patreon, patreon.com slash astronomycast, you get all of our episodes completely advertiser-free through the Patreon feed. So, uh, and the warm like the ads, feeling in your heart that you are directly supporting the salaries of the people who maintain this show. Yes, yes. And... And my and eternal truly fun. independent space and astronomy education. Yes. Yes. And I will mispronounce your name regularly if you uh, endorse us at just the right level. All right. Go to patreon.com slash astronomycast. It's time for another series. This time, we're going to look at the missions that are currently in place across the solar system. Today... We'll start with the key missions here on Earth, studying the planet from above and looking out into the universe. And we'll talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right, well, let's talk about the spacecraft that are looking uh, down. Who is observing our planet? <laughs> and this, so, like, like, just to like, warn people in advance, like, this is an overview. There yeah. are, like going to be hard for this for the earth type stuff for us to really sort of provide a, a comprehensive list but yeah, here's some yeah. of the stuff that we think is really kind of interesting right now 
Yeah, so at the broadest level, there are weather satellites from all the different nations that are interested in maintaining their own weather information. There are communication satellites, governmental, private, everything in between. There are uh, so many spy satellites, (laughs) so many spy satellites. Um, And then there's like, the stuff that this show really gets behind. We have two space stations right now. There's the International Space Station, which really started construction back in 1998 and carried on from uh, what had been the Soviet Union and then Russia's Mir space station. It was used as the training ground and then ISS was constructed as a platform that uh, is very much a peacekeeping platform. They're finally starting to do a fair amount of science, but the main mission is to keep a whole bunch of nations working together that might not otherwise work together. Um, and then China, that wasn't allowed on the ISS, was like, okay, we're just going to build our own. So uh, they're, they're off to the side. They launched theirs in 2021, and this is Tian Gong. Um, and they're working to keep it uh, occupied a great deal of the time. And... Um, It's fun to track how many space toilets are in space. It has often been pointed out that the ratio of humans to toilets is the best anywhere that humans exist if you go to orbit. Right. That's funny. So so where do you want to start? I mean, I think, you know, we're going to not talk about the spy satellites. We're not going to talk about the communication systems, navigation systems. Starlinks, any of that kind of stuff, <laughs> right? Like that is not interesting to us. Um, you know, it's not it's not that it's not important. It's just that's not what we yeah. nerd out and obsess about. So, so what are the kinds of missions, or what are the specific missions that you're really interested in and want to sort of highlight when we talk about what's here at Earth? So, so I have to admit, I discovered in prepping for this mission for this episode this mission i love it <laughs> feels Flip. like it yeah um in prepping for this episode i discovered nasa and isa have far more earth facing satellites than i had any idea about yeah uh, i was a little sort of nervous when you suggested this as a topic this week i'm like this is, will be the longest episode we've ever done yeah so Earth long Buckle yeah up, everybody Yeah, so instead of going through them one by one, which would be an act of hate, I I think a good place to start is looking at what are the technologies that we employ for science on a regular basis. And the Landsat satellite is really the old... it, it is the one you look it's the one you look to for inspiration of this is the way it's done right and the landsat missions keep it pretty simple they have uh, two sets of imaging cameras with a gazillion different wavelengths that they can observe in and by the being ab- what was that the mail's here yeah seriously um And uh, I'm really hoping that's not the person here to mow our lawn. I'm really hoping that they didn't come an hour early. Anyways, carrying on. Sorry, Rich, you're going to have to edit that out. Um, So the the Landsats are really the, the gold standard for Earth observatories. They are out there looking at our planet in myriad different wavelengths that allow them to see difference in water uptake by plants, different in differences in kind of plants from place to place, differences in soil and soil quality. And they were sort of that thing that allowed us to start to realize hey, different places because of what's going on beneath the canopy if you change what colors of light you look at, you start to realize this is actually different vegetation and different, basically under the canopy, a different reality. So yeah, they're cool. Pretty pictures. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, the Landsat series, oh, they're in the late teens at this point. 18? 
I forget which is the latest Landsat. Anyway, but but it is just like they started launching in the 70s. And so there's just this continuous every couple of years, another Landsat launches. They put new technology onto this spacecraft and then fly it. And so each one, as it comes online, has the latest and greatest technology for Earth observation and yet fits into this ecosystem of existing satellites. And so, so, so you've just pull. accidentally merged two different satellite series. You just mer merged the GOES series and the Landsats. Um, so the Landsat, well, the is the the Landsat is only on number nine. The GOES are in their late teens. Okay, sorry, yeah, 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 all right. So so the the GOES missions are, are put out by NOAA. So so we have Landsat is, that's out there doing the imaging thing, doing the imaging thing. And Landsat images are great for things like watching sprawl, the result of droughts, the result of flooding, where you can see change in our planet over time and you can start to understand how you can ch watch the changes in vegetation and everything else just through different color images. The GOES missions, which are in their, I think, late, whatever number goes with the letter R in the alphabet, right. um, they're out there doing imaging as well, but they're more tuned towards studying our planet's atmosphere. They're uh, in collaboration with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, whereas Landsat is in collaboration with the United States Geological Survey. And this difference in collaboration partners that NASA has for these two different missions um, points that are need to understand both the land and the atmosphere above it because they work together. At any given moment, we probably have one Landsat, possibly two. Um, and we also typically have four different geos satellites that are looking down. And one of the things about the geo satellites that causes me great amusement and occasional sadness is they will often start out as like geos L, geos M, um, and it's it's spelled goes G O E S. Yeah, I was I was pronouncing it as goes, but sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I realized I was saying it wrong because this pun doesn't make sense if you say it right, if you say it wrong. Um, so the GOES missions, A through R now, had GOES P for a while. And while it was still on the planet, it was referred to as GOES P. But once it got into its station keeping orbit, they switched it over to having a numbered name. And that brought me sadness. Right. So I, and I, I love this idea that you've got these long running programs where yeah. the goal is always the same. We want to have images of the earth as high resolution as as we can. We want we want to keep track of the weather in as high resolution as the current technology will yeah. allow. And so that you're constantly making sure that you have those spacecraft available to do this job. And they're just constantly taking pictures at high resolution. They're freely available. You can yeah. use them for whatever you want. And and that NASA makes sure NASA and NOAA make sure these things are constantly a presence on Earth. And so that sort of is is like more of like a generic kind of concept. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I want to talk about sort of some specific missions now that are trying to solve specific problems or questions. And we'll talk about that in a second. But it is time for another break. And we're back and we're back. All right, so let's let's talk about some like more specific missions that are trying to solve some specific question about about Earth. So so there are uh, a series of missions out there that are specifically measuring the uh, uh, height of ocean water, and this designation to measure the height of ocean water is something that serves a couple of different purposes. So. On one side, this is something that continues to blow my mind away. Because of the rotation of the Earth, the uh, height of the ocean on the eastern coast and the western coast of continents is not the same 
which is part of why you have to have the locks in the Panama Canal. It's it's because the ocean literally is a different height on both sides. Wow. So getting to see things like this, we've also been able to discover that there are gravitational anomalies by looking at the surface height of the ocean. There's an anomaly out in the Indian Ocean uh, where our planet just doesn't tug the way it was expected. And, and so there are a bunch of different missions that are out there happily looking at our Earth and doing things like measuring the depth, not the depth, measuring the surface level of the ocean. And there's there's one mission, um, I forget the name, but this is from the European Space Agency, where they are scanning the ocean heights with such, ac such accuracy that they're yes. able to measure wave heights. And so yes. now they're finding rogue waves out yes. in the middle of the ocean, when before these are, these are just the stuff of legend. You know, some would disappear and people thought there'd be a rogue wave. People would say, oh, we experienced this enormous, crazy wave. Yeah. But now it's just tracking them all and seeing all of these rogue waves and, and noting their heights and, and setting new records for how big waves can get out in the middle of the ocean in places that nobody's ever experienced them before. But And I love how just in the time that we've been doing this show, rogue waves have gone from being... I don't know if you can call something a cryptid weather phenomena, but I don't know how else to put it. Right. The kind of thing that like we told small children, those don't actually yeah. exist. Rogue waves to, and mermaids. Yeah. I'm sure you saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So so we're we're still pretty sure that that the the mermaids don't actually exist, but rogue waves, totally there, totally there. Yeah. Um, and then other, you know you can measure the heights then there's other spacecraft that are looking at the heights of ice and snow yes so we have a series of different arctic arctic observers from uh both european missions and u.s missions that are doing two different things they're measuring the heights of the ice they're measuring the cover of the ice in the arctic and around antarctica and they are measuring the reflectivity of the water and the ice that is there. And this combination of data, which requires a slightly different orbit because you're trying to observe the poles, uh, this is allowing us to catch things like, oh, shoot, a giant iceberg the size of, name whichever state or country is currently the size of the latest iceberg, has just broken off and then track them as they both go across the ocean and melt or go across the ocean and hit landforms and scrape them bare. And both are traumatizing in different ways. <laughs> when the icebergs melt, they raise sea levels and change the salinity of the ocean. When the icebergs hit land and scrape across it, the penguins that like need places and the seabirds that need places to reproduce lose their places to reproduce so icebergs are finding all sorts of multiple ways to make life hard for seabirds and penguins <laughs> right yeah thanks icebergs yeah um and yeah. giant ocean lining ships in the yeah. early 1900s um there are Earth observation satellites that are analyzing the constituents of the atmosphere and the temperatures. Yes. And, and here we have missions. And what's cool is we also have Trace doing the same thing at Mars. And I love it when we have the same tech at multiple worlds. Yeah. Uh, we, we have different missions that are going through and they're either grabbing samples from the upper atmosphere or they're lose, using a variety of different spectrometers at different wavelengths to measure the hazes in our own atmosphere, the clouds in our own atmosphere, um, measuring things like the thankfully disappearing hole in the ozone layer. And, and so this is giving that holistic what is the Earth's atmosphere doing that we need to both understand the uh, increase in things like skin cancer that we see, as well as to more correctly model, well, things like climate change and global warming and acid rain and, and yeah, spacecraft often tell us things about our planet we wish we didn't know. It's the ones around other planets that bring us joy and happiness. The resolution on these atmospheric sensors have gotten so good yeah. now 
that they can measure specific sources of methane. So yes. I don't know if you remember there was that methane leak in the pipeline yep. from Russia during the you know during the early war that you know someone had sabotaged the pipeline and so it was bubbling natural gas up to the top of the ocean yeah. and you could see this giant methane blob that was hovering over the ocean and they're able to track methane emissions leaks from pipes uh, see factories that are expected to be cleaning mm -hmm. up their methane that are actually really seeing it into the atmosphere and you're getting to the point now where these spacecraft can just spot any individual methane emission that's going on and then figure out you know people can figure out whether that's supposed to be there should it be you know, is there a leak going on? Yeah. And we're right around the corner from the same thing with carbon dioxide. So some and of the SO4. largest, yeah, yeah. And so some of the largest power plants around their specific carbon dioxide emissions are now visible from space. And so we're getting to a point where you can actually track back carbon dioxide emissions to individual facilities that maybe, you know, should be using scrubbers or, or capture technology and aren't. And so hopefully this will be a really powerful tool to be able to keep track of, of atmospheric emissions as we move forward. Filed under the category of more things our satellites have allowed us to know that we wish we didn't. Uh, early during COVID, it was actually Earth observing satellites capable of measuring the constituents in the atmosphere that were able to allow people outside of China to understand just how bad uh, COVID was affecting uh, China because of atmospheric changes due to increased use of crematoriums. Hmm. And, and so we are at the point where we can literally see the output of crematoriums and its effects on the atmosphere and assess death rates from that. So things you didn't want to know, and now you do. Can we switch right. to something happier? Can I bring you something happier? We can, but let's do another break. Okay. And we're back. All right, I'm, I'm fine with happy. What do you Yay! got? Yay, okay. So my favorite thing that Earth satellites are used for is LIDAR, because with the correct lasers, you can, I uh, basically look through the forests and find Mayan ruins. You can uh, get to slightly different uh, reflectivities of different land over archaeological sites. And we don't think about it, but we are constantly being hit with, well, not constantly, but on the regular if we are outside at the right moment, we are getting hit with laser light from these LIDAR systems that have like half meter resolution to meter resolution on our planet and they fire down massive amounts of green laser or other color laser. They'll only detect a hand, handful of photons going back up, but these results are allowing us to see ancient civilization sites without having to actually dig them up. And so we're starting to see what were the roadways associated with mm. different known cities? What were the smaller townships in ancient societies? With, with Mayan ruins, there was a case of a kid finding using different maps and different information from uh, Mayan sources being like, there should be a city here, using Google Maps going, yeah, this actually looks like there could be a city here. And then folks with LIDAR being like, yeah, we actually think we can see where the roads are. And, and so there are a lot of places, specifically Mayan, Incan, Aztec ruins, that got consumed by forests that make it nearly impossible to go in with a, a archeological scouting unit that can't say for certain whether or not they're gonna find something. There's just not the budget to support that kind of thing. But with LIDAR and multi-wavelength observations, we are actually able to peel away the surface of the world and say, this is why we see Turco turquoise from the American Southwest so far into South America. This is why we see 
bones from things that were only in South America as far north as the Cahokia Mounds on the Mississippi. Um, we're starting to uncover the vast civilizations that built stuff with dirt or built stuff that got eaten by forests that otherwise we'd never be able to see. Um, sort of on a side note, we had a LIDAR scan done of our property when we moved here, and yeah. it's down to centimeters resolution. Oh, from an airplane? No, from a drone. Oh, and So they that's fly cool. a drone over the property with a LIDAR equipped to it. And then they just scan the whole property. And so I have a file that is about 200 gigabytes. That is my entire property scanned down to the centimeter ish resolution. And yeah. so it's like individual trees, right? <laughs> like, oh, I, I see that, you know, there's that tree and there's that tree. Yeah. And it's, and then here's this open spot and here's the rock on the ground over there. And, and it's quite astonishing what could be done with these, these lighter. Now you're not going to get the same resolution because you're flying at a much yeah. higher altitude, but I, I love how, you know, when we think of earth as a planet, as an astronomical object that is worthy of study, this is what it feels like to yeah. properly have a world under study that, you know, when you think back to like Star Trek and they want to send in a probe to, to analyze a planet and search for bio signs and, and, uh, you know, study the atmosphere and so on. Like th we've got this on earth. We have yeah. multiple spacecraft that are producing maps of the surface. We're studying the atmosphere. We are studying the, the water, the height of the water to sub millimeter accuracy. We are detecting the amount of forest cover, forest fires, air pollution, uh, migrations of life forms, hidden cities, um, all of these things, thanks to space and satellites. And we couldn't do this. Like we just wouldn't know as yeah. much about our world without being able to fly in space. And and we right. did we did do what I suggested with Jupiter, and we stuck one of the Earth observers at the Lagrange point. Looking back, NASA's yeah. Discover mission is out there getting constant views of whatever's facing the sun and just watching the world rotate. This is my response to the conspiracy theorists who are always like, how come there's no pictures of Earth? I'm like, go check out the Discover feed. And they take pictures, you know, whatever, a dozen images a day of the Earth from the yeah. L2 Lagrange point. It's the entire planet. It's amazing. It's amazing. And you can watch and see the storms that you're familiar with. Oh, there's Hurricane Lee forming in the Atlantic. There's this storm that's currently battering. Here's cloud cover that I am currently experiencing. And you can see this. I mean, you can see this in the GOES images as well, but it's, yeah. and it's more zoomed in. But the, but the one that shows just the whole planet is the Discover feed. And, you know, you can just keep updating these images and see the planet changing hour by hour yeah. all the time. Yeah. And so like, this is it. This is the image. Like if you reject this image, then you just literally reject evidence entirely. Yeah. And yeah. So there's no point having a conversation. So it's anyway, it's now true. I have, you know, we are out of time and yet we have only talked about looking inward. We haven't talked about looking outward. So I propose that we split this episode into two pieces. And next week we talk about the, the satellites that are orbiting earth that are not looking down that are actually looking out. Sounds great. I will update oh. the calendar. All right. Life is good. Yeah. And I, I reserve the right to extend it again because <laughs> There's a lot of cool stuff that's out there. So this could this episode could be the remainder of our careers, this series, or you know we might stick to the schedule. We'll see what happens. All right, thanks, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser, and thank you to everyone out there. Uh, as a reminder, uh, if you uh, contribute to our show at the correct level on Patreon.com/slash/AstronomyCast, I will attempt and likely fail to pronounce your name once a month. Uh, this week, I would like to thank Smansky, Sean Matz, Sam Brooks and his mom, Andrew Stevenson, Stephen Coffey, Benjamin Carrier, Cami Rassian, Frank Tippin, Bart Flaherty, Nate Detweiler, the lonely sand person, Dean, Philip Walker, the air major, John Drake, Brian Kelby, uh, Lou Zealand, Nilu, uh, Dis Disastrina, Plant Star, Sydney Walker, Jordan Turner, Robert Hundle, Paul Esposito, Bob Zatsky, Arthur Latz Hall, David Bogarty. Bogarty? I don't know. 
I'm sorry. Um, Sabra Lark, Hal McKinney, Berno Letts, Jimmy Bergen, Ruben McCarthy, Daniel Donaldson, Ron Thorson, Jason Cad. Dacus, Time Lord Iroh, Frank Stewart, Christian Golding, Will Hamilton, Sterling Gray, Adam W., Simeon Toffeson, Jeff McDonald, and Lee Harborn. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. And Pamela, here is to a quick recovery. We'll see Thank you next you. week. Bye-bye. And then they saved again. 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 We should just do like the whole year's worth of astronomy casts in one day. They have, There's I don't not think enough hours. There is. Because we do, like, say we do 42 episodes. I don't think what we do. Minus eight. So we do like 48. That would be, and say we take half an hour to do each one. So that's 24 hours. One day. We have never managed to do everything in one hour. No, and we did two episodes. We're already running late right now. Yeah. yeah. And I got to run. Yeah. Um, so that's it. No time for questions. Although, you know, Monday we just did all questions. So uh, just need to upload and we'll move on. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Yep. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. And and then I failed to click any of the correct buttons. Okay.